Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge and I'm your host. I'm the author of 11 books, the CEO of 12 years, the founder of a startup set on data privacy, most importantly, an elite performance coach of over 18 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. Most excitingly, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and athlete performance specifically behind how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. My work includes everything from mitigating injuries to conditioning behaviors that set a player up long term for the long game towards a top 10 tennis ranking. I'm behind theories from the optimal performance theory, optimal behavior for optimal performance, the barrier breaker, the rule of transfer, to the golden rule. As has become custom, each episode we dive into one of my books to share additional insights and dig a little bit deeper. We've been focusing on the secrets to optimal coaching success, the role of experience, optimal performance practices and outcomes in the real world. With over 50 episodes to date, today's topic plays its own role like so many other episodes in developing the player, parent to coach for that road ahead towards a top 10 tennis ranking. So as always, buckle in and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Whether you are new or you've been with us for some time now, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to share a few extra snippets in today's episode. Um, One, because my book is around the corner and two um, which is going to date today's episode slightly is the ATP uh, finals. Uh, That said we did um, a few episodes back do a recount very briefly on the WTA finals so it would not be fair if I did not uh, give the ATP to a finals the same courtesy but I also think there are some really interesting insights more so um, here to to really dive into and it's not necessarily saying that they're more impressive than the WTA Tour absolutely not that is not what I'm saying what I'm talking about is potential unexpected results whereas um, for me personally anyway when we're looking at the data um, Um, on the WTA tour they were of no shocks and or surprises however I think for for some people potentially when we're looking at the ATP tour there are maybe a few surprises there that I thought I, I would just shed some extra light on today But before we dive into that, uh, the good news is, um, and recall how I shared the title of my new book that's coming out very, very soon, How to Develop a Top 10 Tennis Ranking. I'm really excited. And given that these episodes are roughly two, three weeks apart, There is a very good chance by the time you are listening um, to this episode that it it could very well be on the stands because it is under the pump and I have promised that it would be available before Christmas. So you would have also noted that our episodes um, or our releases have slightly changed over the last couple of weeks Um, in contrast obviously to those two that were really consistent up to let's say those 58 episodes um but today marks episode 59 and i really wanted to uh, make sure 
I keep my promise. I keep that word to make sure um, how to develop a top 10 tens ranking is there for you, ready for you in time for Christmas. So I'm trying to um, wind down beyond top 10 tens ever so slightly to ensure that can happen. I would absolutely love your feedback in that respect and how you're finding um, two episodes weekly and or uh, one episode weekly. Obviously with their accompanying blogs, thoughts, um, would really be appreciated because all those insights are incredibly helpful. But most importantly, as we touched on in in the last one to two episodes, um, I revealed the byline of the, the subtitle, which is the power of the eighth key. That yes, there is an eighth key. And that has to be perhaps the most exciting element of it all. Recall uh, the seven keys to optimize your life, which really captured the seven keys that are responsible to uh, for attaining, progressing towards a top 10 tennis ranking. And if you're new, this this might come as a shock, but we do have obviously that extensive catalogue now today that really touched on the seven keys and those inner workings. Um, I'd probably encourage you to look at those recaps. We've got um, parts of one through to five that really um, touch on some key insights of the secrets to optimal performance success and the applicability and or applications of their relevance of those seven keys but what we're talking about now is that was a complete text of seven keys um how to develop a top 10 10 is a ranking is one key it comprises of one key that is how extensive it is with the data and i'm really excited for this one to be released um a little secret is that i'm happy to share now is that this is potentially um my first book that i wanted to release eight years ago Uh, but because of um our staggered approach which some of you may or may not be aware with we need to abide by the science, which which essentially means that we've got all this data that tells us we need to do this, this, then this. Now, if we do it the other way around, it doesn't work. By having this staggered approach, it shows you essentially, let's go from key one, two, three, four, through to seven, opposed to revealing the eighth key would not make sense if you were not privy to uh, one through to seven as a starting point. And the irony there is that those initial seven keys were not able to be released until the background work was released prior to that. So it has been an absolutely extensive body of work today. And of course, it's been very exhaustive um, to a point as well. But having known all along for eight years um, with it, I guess, um, through this body of work where um, it has been released and 11 years from when the data started to be collated and that I've been sitting on this all along, how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. It is so exciting to be able to, I guess, share that missing piece. And I really would encourage each and every one of you to get your hands on it when it is released. That'd be amazing and thank you in advance. (laughs) But what I'm sharing here is that to be able to, I think, get the most out of it, being familiar with the seven keys is absolute it's a prerequisite and obviously for the seven keys to really understand what they are and where they come from it's really important to be familiar with the text prior to that because when we're looking at the development of an athlete um, irrespective if they're 11 12 years of age or 26 27 years of age Um, there's essentially a blueprint to follow. That's a very big secret there. (laughs) And we need to understand the moving parts. So if you think of it as as a puzzle as such, it's really about thinking uh, a top 10 tennis ranking is almost akin to a complete puzzle. 
but if you have all these missing pieces so if you only have parts of that puzzle even if it is 60 percent if you're missing that 40 percent we're saying no i'm sorry but that top 10 tennis ranking that that is not correlate with the data not what we're looking at and i acknowledge that there's going to be a lot of people out there unfortunately that ignore the data or don't understand the data and to to those of you i say if you don't understand it please don't be scared from it because we've done an absolutely um huge effort in really i think simplifying it in the best possible way because we're all familiar with the scientific jargon out there and i really pride myself in in sharing it non uh, from a non-complex angle even though things can get quite complicated within reason if there is something you're unfamiliar with i can guarantee you it is in the body of work so it's in one of the preceding texts so it was built from the secrets to optimal performance success was the very first text this one the secrets to optimal coaching success was actually not the third um even though it's the third in its series was actually the fourth release because prior to that was the science of elite performance which is an absolutely extensive volume in and of itself that really unravels i think more of the the, the science um specifically and it is probably not one to pick up on the first go because it is that extensive but if you follow along text 1 through to 10 this 11th release um which is phenomenal which is really exciting is almost that final piece of the puzzle in this respect of course i do have those 11 texts but again those of you who are familiar with my work um one of those books so my actually my most recent one released last year was my first fictional release so this is actually has been almost a two-year period trying to piece together how it would come about um irrespective of knowing the end point i really wanted to take the time and be conscious of how it was going to be molded together in the best possible way for you to get the most out of it and for you to walk away then with those complete 11 books as irrespective as extensive as it sounds to be able to head towards that top 10 tennis ranking because it's it's so important and earmark them to progress which i think is a really good turning point to <laughs> remain true on that promise to just share those additional insights from um the atp tour finals and i think a really good starting point even though um of course this is going to come out after the champion um, has been crowned and i'm sharing this before that so i don't know um you will know at this point though but i do not know who is going to win though i can give you some key metrics and probabilities of those outcomes or explain to you what these results have come from now i think one of the biggest or will i'm going to start from the most recent um and it's we're not at the final stages yet but Alcaraz, for example, has toppled Rublev. I think most of us probably are not surprised by that result. However, Rublev has to be one of the most consistent players all year round. That definitely deserves his place inside the top 10. Um, all of these players who have made the finals really do. Um, the questions obviously arise when those Grand Slam performances are not able to be correlated. And I will give some examples. Um, in, in by that I mean essentially players who reach the first, second, third round of a Grand Slam 
all year round. They do not progress to the round of 16 or further or a player that reaches the semi-finals of one Grand Slam and then makes say the second round, third round, round of 16 and that's it all year round. However, they're ranked inside the top 10. Those results are not conducive with when we're looking at the power of the eighth key. When we're looking at maintaining that top 10 tennis ranking in the upcoming seasons. We're looking at players that have those type of results and they're incredibly likely to be displaced by the more consistent player. And we have data that obviously not underlines that, well it does, but the outcomes are there. As in it's proven time and time again that um, it has worked, that the, the data that backs how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, it's been reaffirmed over and over again. And one of, I think, the biggest highlights here is that flagging Alcaraz to ascend towards the top 10. And all of a sudden he did it. He actually uh, did it a lot more rapidly than predicted. We had uh, looked at, I had within two seasons, and he did it before the season's end, which was quite a phenomenal result when we're looking at that. One player potentially who is, is not at this stage is Rudd, whereas his results have not really aligned this season as much as I would have thought and or liked, uh, for example. However, you then have the likes of a uh, Zarev who has come back from an injury um, that put him out for almost 12 months and he is really showed his ability to reach again that level of play that made him ascend to a Grand Slam final, allowed him to do that, but also to keep his place inside the top 10 for quite a number of seasons. And I think it's really important to uh, highlight this because we talk about the data and we talk about being able to maintain a top 10 tennis ranking, which is an absolutely uh, fundamental part, obviously, to securing not just one Grand Slam, but achieving replicated success. Unfortunately, Zarev is a perfect example of a player who has not won a Grand Slam. Similar to the uh, discussion a few episodes back around around Svitolina. Um, even though Svitolina is not ranked inside the top 10 at this stage, prior to taking time away from tour, she was one of the top players over the last 10 years to maintain her hold inside the top 10. Now, when we're looking at the data, Zarev is almost synonymous then with the top 10 tennis ranking. And if we factor out the likes of a Federer and Nadal to Djokovic and those who have been incredibly consistent over that decade of play, Zarev is up there. Then there's one or two other players um, I can touch on, but I really want to underscore that this is absolutely no surprise, which uh, reaffirms and tells us that he is privy to the seven keys. Djokovic is privy to the seven keys. Alcaraz being able to rise to number one and win his maiden Grand Slam and keep a hold of his level of play is also privy to the seven keys. Um, recall the seven keys underscore a top 10 tennis ranking. What this eighth key does it allows you to stay there, which means it reaffirms the likes of a Svitolina to Zarev with the eighth key. Um, but more than that, it touches on the likes of not just Djokovic, it looks at the uh, Federer to Serena to Nadal. We're looking at the players with more than, or 20 or more than Grand Slam championship titles. And it's been reaffirmed over and over and over again, because we're looking at collectively over 80 Grand Slam championships, which is absolutely incredible. Um, over this uh, time frame, but it actually goes beyond that, which which is even more exciting. And when you do leverage science and you look at the qualitative and the quantitative data sets, and you're able to uh, look at and reaffirm key principles, that's obviously where the eight keys now have come from. Which this final book, not not final book essentially, but this release in this respect 
is absolutely incredibly important. So then next up, we can look at Medvedev, who actually did um, topple um, Zarev in the ATP Tour Finals, which is really interesting given that Zarev has had some really solid wins this week. Um, specifically, he came out on top against Alcaraz, and that has to be one of his best wins this season. But recall last season, I well, actually no, I think it was two seasons back before Zarev was injured, that when Zarev won the Tour Finals, and it when he beat Djokovic so he does has the does have the capacity to do that come out with the win against Tissipas T to me that that's not too surprising and I say that because Sinner has been marked for some time now to not just ascend inside the top 10 but to really be marked to reach the level of success of an Alcaraz and to toe the line. And when I mean that, I look at Sinner and Alcaraz as being the next generation of that one and two in the world. And that is where though that level of play is predicted to be there, opposed to Rune. And Rune really did start gaining more traction, surprisingly, prior to Sinner. And, and I mean that as of late. Uh, well, not the last six months, but prior to that, Sinner had a little bit of a lull where he was ranked between 10 and 15 in the world and Rune actually got inside the top 10 prior, which is a very interesting, I think, discussion then to be had. But the best part about Sinner, the absolutely best part, is that his performance was progressive. And when a performance is progressive and it's steadily progressive, it's not too quick, <laughs> not too slow but as long as it hits that sweet spot really good things can happen and by really good things is that Sinner as I'm sure you're all familiar with by now did and or has um defeated Djokovic three sets extensive in a, a, the, the best possible way however we've got almost almost three tie breaks but this is not shocking this is something that our data and that I considered as highly probable because when we're looking at Sinner's metrics, he has that capacity. And so this result is almost icing on the cake in the best possible way. This is not to say anything negative in any way, shape or form from Djokovic because he has claimed the year um, end ranking at number one which is phenomenal in and of itself. Though the argument, and I've touched on this in a couple of episodes, is that why Djokovic is at that level of play. And essentially it's because he's been able to maintain such a high caliber of play for an extended period of time. And these other players, these ATP tour players, simply have not. They are yet to reach this level of play. But what we've got now is that Medvedev periodically reaches that level of play. Zarev, almost, almost, that is why he has not um, captured that number one ranking as an example. But when we're looking at the likes of an Alcaraz to Sinner, they have been relatively very consistent. They are both knocking on the door in this respect. Rune, um, he has been a little bit less consistent this season, but he's had incredible peaks, which are noteworthy. Rublev also has been very consistent, although is, is yet to obviously make his mark in obviously that championship or Grand Slam championship final. Tizipas obviously has reached those heights. He's made that final in in the past but he's not as consistent which means he's not reaching say the you know the quarters the semi-finals every single grand slam and and nudging the dial a little bit further when we're looking at the likes of a Djokovic of course that's that's what he does um, and that that really I think overshadows then the others that are coming knocking on his door but they're, they're just not there yet However, in contrast, when we're looking at the WTA Tour, Swiatek has 
really at the helm, but Sabalenka, for a short period of time, for a, for a few months, held on to that number one ranking and, and deservedly slow with that maiden Grand Slam this year. But then you've got the likes of Gorf as well, and then Pagula reaching the finals and having a really, I, I want to say, a very consistent year that I, I've also touched on in previous episodes. But I think the ATP Tour Finals, it really deserves, I think, a bit of, I think, um, in additional insights in this respect. But it's a bit disappointing as well not to have Rudd included, um, I think, in this mix because he did have a relatively good season. But when we're looking at all of the other events on paper that contribute to a player's ranking, obviously um, that's the case. That's really where it falls. But I like to look at specifically the Grand Slams and when a player is able to perform at the highest level of play is where it really counts. So obviously we're looking at who is has the potential to win these finals. I'm not going to say who, but it really looks like Djokovic to Sinner um, are at the top, but also Alcaraz. You cannot rule him out or Zarev. Medvedev as well, there's a maybe. So that's really the four or five there is that you can't rule anyone out yet at this stage. Obviously, if I recorded this episode... <laughs> tomorrow or in two days times it would be a lot more accurate but I think the advantage of sharing this midway through the round robin is really being able to share some additional insights not giving too much away but we can reflect back on this um, when it comes to air in obviously that two three week time and to just ascertain better I think those endpoints. All right, that's, I think, as promised, we've shared about the book that's coming out, the How to Develop a Top 10 Tennis Ranking. We've shared on the ATP Tour Finals, so we've done a really good due diligence on both topics. Now, it's only fair <laughs> that we dive into today's core topic of the secrets to optimal coaching success, which you are familiar with is note-taking pre- and post-performance. So if you want to follow along, we are on page 72. But before I share, I think, additional insights or extracts from this chapter, I wanted to share, I think, where this has come from and or why. Or most specifically, we can look at the humanized approach. And I think that's well overdue because each and every episode, those who are familiar, I like just showing the reference to reality, <laughs> for lack of better wording which really means when we're taking notes, it's applicability to life and or not just the tennis player. And this is where essentially the tennis player can learn from life. And irrespective if you are that eight, nine, 10 year old, if you're, you're obviously at school and you have a certain learning method that works for you, one of those common points of recall very early on is writing things down, flashcards, post-its, whatever works for you. Now, keep this with you, hopefully, through to that 15, 16, 17 years of age. Obviously, you're becoming or have become better, more refined in that note-taking, what specifically works for you, what phrases, if you need uh, whole paragraphs, just, just snippets of those paragraphs, how, how you prepare, say, for an exam even or one of those finals um, then in reality if you have made it all the way through to university you're doing your undergraduates or maybe postgraduate but let's focus on you're doing some other study post high school secondary school <laughs> depending obviously where you're based in the world you're going to frame that a little bit differently uh, those who are familiar though I am based in Australia so I do use references um, Australian references. So in this context, um, you would have fine-tuned how you learn, how specifically um, th those note cards work for you, those post-its work for you, whether you have those notes next to your bed, on your fridge, irrespective, they're everywhere around the house, all, all through your bedroom, I don't know, maybe you have your own poster that has explicit phrases that help you um, recall key knowledge you're after. If you're a professional, 
um, so in your work life, um, you're going to have key points, whether they're kept in your phone, in your diary, key points of reference to remember uh, core topics, things to be discussed. You have your to-do list in a manner of speaking. So not so much the to-do list that we want to focus on. We want to focus on the, the, those key notes, those, those facets that you really want to make um, easy to remember, to recall, because they have some type of importance, uh, an applicability for that endpoint to succeed in an exam for those undergraduates or those 16, 17 year olds finishing their schooling years and or for the parents and or guardians out there um, in your professional life, whichever points of recall you require for uh, your given profession. And I'm really trying to keep it very general here because when we're then looking at the tennis player, <laughs> that's what we hear more. Uh, note taking is absolutely fundamental. Unfortunately, it's not universal. Um, most uh, clubs and or centres to academies I've been with, whether it's Australia, Europe, United States, note taking is not readily encouraged. It is not a practice that I see um, often upkept. Um, um, a couple of months ago, I oversaw a, a local up and coming player and absolutely no, no cars were available. It was almost foreign. And I handed him some explicit notes on, on, a, on a card to ensure he would remember them. And, and we will get there. Did I see him regularly review them? Absolutely not. And that's what brings us uh, to today's episode, is that those note cards are key points of reference. And inadvertently, I was doing him a huge favor in introducing this step into his game that he had not become familiar with. Interestingly as well, the coaches at that center did not encourage this nor practice this. But one of these um, key aspects of, let's say, a coach's pedagogy is making sure not only you have an effective coach-athlete relationship, but you have the toolkit of an elite coaching pedagogy, which really is touched on in um, how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking, <laughs> which is really exciting because I'm giving away those answers of what it really takes because building the foundations early on allows a greater uh, rate of success in those late years. So specifically when they're, when we're looking at the long game to the pathway, the initial 10 years of play, um, in those 10 years of play, we want to integrate the seven keys. If you are a player on the ATP or WTA tour, looking to ascend towards the top 10, you could be ranked 30 in the world, top 20 in the world. Now, if you uh, have the seven keys, you are marked to progress towards the top 10, but it is knowing and maintaining the eighth key that will keep you inside the top 10. This is why, which is really exciting now to share, this is why we have top 10 players who regress. Now these regressions may only be incremental, but this sees a top 10 player regress to say 11 or 12 in the world. It may even be responsible for a player regressing from number four in the world to number 10 in the world, just as an example. One player um, who has regressed and who I touched on earlier um, in respect to the ATP Tour Finals is Rudd. I'm sure he will progress again, but that is a very, it's, it's an area to highlight. One player who has also regressed is Thiem, who was obviously at the top, inside the top 10 for multiple seasons because of his surgery and was quite disheartening to see after he won his maiden Grand Slam championship. But um, unlike, let's say, Zaret, who has been able to recapture um, his top 10 tennis ranking, theme has yet to progress to those heights, which tells us that the seven keys that he originally had to get inside the top 10, and then the eighth key he had to maintain inside the top 10, it means it's been displaced. 
it means it is not being readily applied. And that is a consequence. That is the consequence of losing grip on and or the lack of reinforcement of not just the seven keys, but the eighth key. That is how powerful um, they are. And obviously that is where the power of the eighth key has come from because it really is incredibly powerful um, in the best possible way. But so when we're looking at the, um, the importance then of note taking, it has its applicability in life, but for the player, the developing player, but then also the elite player, whether you are that 300, 200 in the world, or you are looking at progressing towards the top 10, 80 in the world, 60 in the world, it does not matter. But if those points of recall that you're working on are in your notes and you are proactive in your development that makes you earmarked in a manner of speaking to progress and to ascend which is really exciting to be able to share okay if you want to follow along we've got enough time to just draw out a few key sections when under pressure it is more likely to forget new habits and to react through producing old habits that is when learning there is always a version of you that you're overriding you are learning new ways to progressively improve your current performance and by doing so you're producing newer habits which in turn push back your current habits or performances into old habits or performances all right i really would encourage you to rewind and listen to that probably three four even five times to get your head around it but what we're saying really simply is that to change one habit to a new and better habit there's a bit of rewiring that's involved and by rewiring for the athlete it's reconditioning so we need to learn a new skill even though it's incredibly similar for a player who has been hitting the same ball the same way for let's say the past three four five years and then to change it can be incredibly challenging because his biomechanics his natural response his what is his or his or her autonomous response is essentially ingrained to him because because that skill has reached a level of autonomy so to break that level of autonomy it takes practice it's almost building a new skill even even though it's it's just so similar so by that we mean is that we're, we're changing a discrete skill we're not changing the whole serial skill there's a discrete explicit part that we're working on so it's going to still feel quite foreign because of its newness but in order to do that um, you need those points of recall which is where note taking comes in pre-performance so you want those points of recall before you get on the court and post-performance which means after you've stepped off the tennis court what are those points of recall are your notes exactly the same hopefully not hopefully when you've stepped on court you've learned something new you've felt something new and you've nudged your performance closer to reaching that level of autonomy again Instinctively, these old habits are produced when your thinking is compromised. Rather than sticking to a plan that you have practiced and memorized over and over, pressure gets a hold of you and this plan goes out the window. This occurs when old habits creep back into your game or performance. But how come these new habits can so easily be overridden? The answer is simple practice affords consistency and the habit that has been performed more times than the other will come out on top when pressure presents itself this is a really interesting discussion and one worthy of i think again rewinding over and over and over again until i think you grasp the underlying meaning 
Because what we're looking at is when you have a skill and there's the argument out there that to learn a new skill, to reach a level of autonomy, it's around 10,000 movements and or balls, for example. So imagine um, hitting a tennis ball in a certain way 10,000 times, not 100, not 1,000, 10,000 thousand times and then needing to change that now let's say for argument's sake you go to play a match and you want to use that new skill but that new skill has only been practiced performed let's say three to four thousand times by this point so you you know what you're doing it's working for you you have that level of autonomy almost it has been progressing to really positive heights but when a player falls to pressure, when they become susceptible, as every player athlete will at some point within a match, um, whether it's the beginning, whether it's the end or some point between. But what can happen here is that you, the player will fall back to what is of the greatest level of autonomy, which means that previous stroke that was ingrained, that is habitual, that has already been 10,000 plus in practice, will overcome, will come first before that new skill, which is, let's say, at that three, 4,000 um, levels that, that have been this has been repetitive in, in that manner of speaking so here we're looking at how can we maintain that new level of performance over the former irrespective of how often it has been performed and to that we say note-taking and the power of note-taking pre and post so if you walk on court for that match and you have those notes that you have taken you have those points of recall and after the match sure you can review what worked for you and what did not when we're looking at post-match performances but when we're looking at the susceptibility of regressing to that old skill because it has already reached a level of autonomy it is your fallback skill and it will come through in moments of pressure so how do you ensure that new skill that is yet to reach that same level of autonomy but you know it's better and you want to use it and it has been doing exceptionally well until that new that old skill, <laughs> it's a bit of a tongue twister, has taken over. Now, in order to catch this, to prevent this from happening too often or too soon, is to make sure when you are changing ends, and hopefully you have heard this, and this is not new knowledge to you, is to have those points of recall, is to use those notes to your advantage. And you do see some ATP and or ATP and WTA tour players using their notes as a point of recall on change events, which is so, um, I think, incredibly important, sets a wonderful example and it's really zeroing in on what you are focusing on and to have those notes to focus to just knuckle down and go what am I meant to be doing whether it's your serve your forehand your backhand your volley wherever those errors have begun to sprung from that former level of autonomy recall and review those new notes to look at what you need to do irrespective pressure or no pressure to maintain that level of play and i think i want to wrap today's episode up on that because it's so important and i'd really encourage you to review that and hopefully notes is something you are implementing pre and post performance all the time every single week every single session i really hope so every player i work with i'm a big fan on keeping a journal diary whatever you want to fa uh, phrase it and or note cards it, it does not matter but it's so important to have things set um, prior to a lesson prior to a session and also after because you want to know what you're, you're working on to have that point of reference even if you are stepping onto the tennis court in the morning and then heading back in the afternoon you still want to capture so then obviously we're looking at a bit of neuroscience you're in the most simple way that point of capture so even if it is that rewiring it's how can we make that new skill habitual become ingrained <laughs> into our new level of play and that is the power of 
note taking, pre and or post performance, both, and essentially how they can really help you when you're looking at heading towards a top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really hope you had some really good key takeaways, especially you enjoyed insights on how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. The book, it'll be my 12th book that I've released, which is really exciting. Um, ironically, it is actually 12 years as well that I've been at the helm of AMA International. So it's actually a, a wonderful slash ironic play on numbers slash words in that respect. Um, but I also hope you enjoyed those additional insights from the ATP Tour Finals. To complement that, please uh, track back um, of our last couple of episodes that did recount obviously the two of finals and those results in that respect and look as always you know that i leave all of the links in the bio to the show notes which means you'll be able to really easily see watch each and every episode references key points of recall to review and go over um, look to grab a copy of the secrets to optimal coaching success head on over to animate international that is aimatinternational.com and keep an eye out out there because how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking will be up. I promise you, well, I'm very positive by the time you do hear today's episode that we will have something up on AMA International, whether um, it is available or pending um, release within the couple of days and a week, um, it will be there in time. Christmas. <laughs> For any comments or questions, head on over to AMA, that's aminternational.com again, or Topic Thread, the social platform set on data privacy. To interact with Beyond Top 10 Tennis, head on over to Twitter, Threads, LinkedIn, or Instagram. To catch up on our weekly coaching tips, head on over to TikTok. And to catch up on our blogs, head on over to AMA International and look for our blogs tab or to Medium. And as always, Always, I'll leave all the links in the episode notes. And a special shout out to everyone on Medium who has been interacting with our blogs and the feedback there. I really appreciate it immensely. Thank you so much. Um, but something different, head on over to Pink Octopus Books. That's where my fictional release is. To view this week's question and poll, be sure to visit Spotify if you're listening on one of the other platforms, and there's a number of them out there. Um, or for something left of field, visit Spruik for some random polls. And of course, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, like, share, and or all of the above would be absolutely phenomenal. And for those of you who are interested, we do have scholarships available on AIM international as well as options to work with me exclusively to optimize your performance to nudge you closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking which is so important if you are preparing for the 2024 season the australian summer season with the australian open around the corner now which oh my goodness time has flown please do get in touch. If you want to progress to the round of 16 quarterfinal semis and or increase the likelihood of making your maiden Grand Slam championship final or securing your maiden championship, please do get in touch. So don't be shy and come and say hi. On that note, thank you so much for listening. I am so incredibly grateful. I am your host, Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge, and this is Beyond Top 10 Tennis, and I'll see you next time.